Welcome to Pushback. I'm Mary Matte. Joining me is Samuel Moyne. He is a professor at Yale Law School and a professor of history at Yale University. His new book is Humane, How the United States Abandoned Peace and Reinvented War. Samuel, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me, Aaron. Your book has gotten some controversy. It's been attacked by both uh, people on the left and the right, which is always a good sign, I think. Um, before we get into some of the controversies, let me just ask you to lay out your thesis. As I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, you are arguing that the process of making the conduct of U.S. wars more humane has, in fact, legitimized and prolonged the underlying enterprise of war itself. Yeah, that's basically it. You know, I'm interested in how it was that Barack Obama uh, could reinvent the war on terror. Um, and as I see it, it was central to that reinvention that he could respond to the way that people had attacked George W. Bush's war. And that was largely on the grounds, not that it was illegal, but that it was fought illegally. And the results were that Obama was able to offer a humane and legal form of the war on terror, which continues to this day. So talk to us about how Obama came about that. I mean, first of all, he campaigns as kind of a peace candidate. He highlights the fact that he opposed the Iraq war, of course, on narrow strategic grounds. I don't think he ever called it illegal. Um, no. But then, so how does he go from portraying himself as being uh, this champion of peace who is going to uh, turn the page on the Bush era? And then what actually happened when he comes into office? You know, Obama was brilliant, at least as, as a kind of electoral strategist, because he was the first in now a succession of three presidents who have won by selectively opposing American war, two of them against Hillary Clinton. Um, so he, Barack Obama ascended against Hillary Clinton, in, in part at least because she'd voted for the Iraq war. Donald Trump uh, falsely claimed, first against fellow Republicans, that he'd been against the Iraq war and beat them and then beat Clinton. And uh, then you have Joe Biden, who also in the midst of his campaign uh, said he was against the forever war and, and did uh, pull troops from Afghanistan. Obama in his first days in office had to figure out what to do with the war on terror. And it's quite important that a lot of people were generous to him. Journalists who had been, you know, merciless with Bush, uh, singling out uh, hit, hit the way that he and his lawyers allowed violations, not of international law, you know, prohibiting war, but international law prohibiting bad things in war like torture. And uh, Obama on his, on his first day in office, uh, although the torture had long since stopped, at least in its you know, kind of gross forms, ordered the shredding of the torture memos. He went to Oslo when he won the Nobel Peace Prize in his first year in office and promised to, if, if it was necessary to fight, fight humanely and in accordance with the laws of war. Now we know, that in the same period, his first year, he was pivoting away from even detaining anyone anymore, since that had caused all the legal problems that activists and journalists used to delegitimize the first form of the war on terror. But in pivoting away from detaining people, Obama didn't pivot away from war. He pivoted to killing people. And that was, of course, through the drone program and special forces. And um, instead of ever really focusing with Obama on the continuation endlessly of the war on terror, we, we kind of continued within the humanity frame. At most people indicted, again, fairly and nobly, um, you know, civilian casualties. Um, in, in other words, mistakes in, or crimes in how war is fought. Um, Actually, Actually, it was Obama himself, more than many of his critics, who kind of called for an end to the war on terror. The trouble is that he, he, I think more than anyone, kind of entrenched it permanently, and that's the way it is now. And what did you learn through your research about the 
people around Obama who provided the legal justification for this. And maybe talk about a couple of key uh, legal briefs that you identified. The one that came in March 2009, I believe, Correct. and then the, the presidential policy guidance a few years later. Sure. So I think to understand this moment, we have to go back just slightly to the Supreme Court's intervention in the war on terror, which of course bore on how detainees were treated, notably in cases like Hamdan v. Rumsfeld. Um, and in, in the beginning of 2009, um, even though those decisions had had to do with Guantanamo and like what happens to people who are captured, um, Obama's lawyers said in, in, first in this legal brief um, that basically we're in a global war and it's a war that we will fight um, in accordance with the law of armed conflict, which meant that we had to place limits on how we treated detained uh, terrorists that, or alleged terrorists that were captured. But that decision about a kind of global frame for the war without any chronological end to it either meant that the targeted killings program kind of assumed kind of no limits in space and time to who could be killed um, by, by drones, armed drones or special forces. And so this was a kind of amazing document because it hadn't been issued under Bush. Um, and it was issued under Obama and it kind of remains with us. Now, just before the election in, uh, for his second term, Obama decides that the Republicans could win. Uh, you know, you never know. No one imagined Trump could ultimately win four years later. Um, but Obama thought he ought to write down some rules. And once again, those rules were supposed to be kind of constraining no matter who's president. The trouble is that he made them policy rather than law. So the subsequent president, as Donald Trump did, would be able to rip, rip them up. But what's amazing is the rules, um, while not imposing any constraints on where or for how long, um, kind of drone strikes can take place, did call for them to be way more humane, even than international law requires. And many people, as I uh, talk about in the book, kind of cried foul because they said, you're compensating with claims that you'll fight humanely for the fact that you've just declared a forever war with this sinister technology and expanded the war on terror in space more than uh, Bush himself had fought it. Uh, he was supposed to be hope you can believe in uh, or change you can believe in, but he mainly changed the war on terror by kind of pivoting to this more geographically expansive uh, form of shadow war and promising when he finally did so publicly that it would be, you know, careful and humane and never kill civilians. It was false. Uh, they didn't follow those rules because so many died, but it was amazing that he made the promise and that he had to care about the how of drone war, even while authorizing the thing itself. Yeah, and the rules themselves are pretty extraordinary. For example, in 2012, uh, you, the New York Times reported this. I remember at the time, this, this is when it sunk in for me, what was really going on. It says this, quote, right. Obama embraced a disputed method for counting civilian casualties that did little to box him in. It, in effect, counts all military age males in a strike zone as combatants unless there is explicit intelligence posthumously proving right. them innocent. Right. So those are signature strikes, so-called. And again, that is totally noxious and it, it's really like reeks of the kind of thing that happened in Vietnam known as free fire zones, where you basically said, okay, everyone who's innocent leave because we're just gonna kill anyone who remains uh, on the assumption that you're fair game. I mean, it's literally the same policy. Um, the, the, the interesting thing to me though, is that um, in a way he, he was trying to get out of 
the the promise um, that he made to the world um, that went beyond what the the actual laws of war require. So in under that law, if you shoot at a, a target that is a fair target, you can kill civilians uh, if it's not disproportionate to your military advantage. But Obama, in this presidential policy guidance, said, we won't kill any civilians ever. If, there, if there's a risk to one, we won't conduct the strike. But of course, uh, what that meant is that you redescribed a lot of civilians as combatants in order to get within the promise of humanity you'd made. So it's it's you're right that it's totally fascinating how um, they they made this promise and then kind of betrayed it. But what I want to focus on is it's the fact that they made it is really revealing when they didn't seem to care about like having to justify to Americans that they were in a forever war or using uh, an illegal tactic in the first place, which is like drones themselves drones outside hot battlefields, which, you know, are, 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 are and ought to be seen as extrajudicial killing. I've always uh, thought that when it comes to choosing between a Democratic and a Republican president that, you know, faced with the choice that the odds of a Democrat committing, you know, inflicting less suffering and death on the world um, that, that, that it's higher that a Democrat will, will inflict less suffering and death, uh, just based on what the history of both parties. Not that I'm a fan of either mm -hmm. party or, or especially sure. Democrats, but just that, you know, that just based on how history has gone. But I'm wondering, based on your re research, where, where you fall on that question. Given, well, given, the extraordinary, on... given the skill that Obama deployed to basically continue sure. the war and continue carrying out the same atrocities. Well, I think it depends on the time scale. So, you know, remember the Democrats started World War II, started the Cold War, started the Vietnam War. After that, I'm with you um, because, you know, you're, you do choose a lesser evil. I vote for Democrats. Um, I voted for Obama two times. Um, but it, 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 the question is, you know, do we have to just compare them to Republicans, or can we push them to be different, um, or can we change the Democratic Party? And here, you know, Obama came out in his National Defense University address in 2013, kind of rolling out the presidential policy guidance, and said, "Look, you want me because the only alternative is big intervention and war crimes, and I'm giving you endless war." but it will be humane and that's the best of all possible worlds but if we reject that then we have to demand you know better democrats or some other party that will give us not more humane war but less war not the problem just, though you know, is obama's argument there is not it's that's not even true because he did give us libya which right. was a direct intervention and well, conducted true. under under humane grounds and Absolutely. he gave us syria he gave us syria as well which was Absolutely. Even more sinister in that it was entirely covert. So, you know, it, it's there, th this is where we have to like reckon with the paradoxes because no, no, no event tanked the anti-war movement in the United States more than Obama's victory itself yeah. because people then gave him the benefit of the doubt for years and years. Um, now, would a Republican have done worse things? Well, I doubt a Republican would have done Libya because Democrats have had a a liking for humanitarian intervention, um, and you know Samantha Power is back in government, et cetera, in spite of her kind of confession that she may have messed up in Libya. Uh, she says that in her memoir. Um, but y you're right that um, the Democrats are disappointing. I still think the Republicans, on balance, tend to be worse. But it's really crucial that you know. The, the Democrats and, and Obama especially have benefited from kind of the, the kind of friendliness of, of kind of progressive critics who want to see what he does first. And it's amazing how true that was amidst um, activists and journalists uh, uh, who in 2009 basically trusted him. And I think we paid the price. 
I think, I mean, it's, it's a counterfactual, but I think I'm confident that John McCain would have done Libya. Okay. I don't see John McCain resisting the temptation of uh, overthrowing a, a disobedient yeah, uh, global fair. South government. Fair. I think that's fair. I mean, he, he just, I think it might've been more difficult since he didn't have um, power, Susan Rice, et cetera, kind of, he wouldn't have had them like explaining how, how to do it via the UN Security Council as a humanitarian intervention. And I'm not, but, but you're right that, you know, on, on geopolitical grounds, he, he didn't, you know, find wars he didn't like. So um, I'm with you. And, and, and so, and, and my main point would be, we, we should um, kind of make sure not to get burned again when we elect Democrats, which we've just done, you know, and that's why I'm, I'm you know, we should, can get into this, why we should be very wary of, of what Joe Biden's doing and promising. But of course, we, we can also push the Democrats over time to be less interventionist. Let's talk about Biden. Uh, I'm curious, your analysis of his, his coda in Afghanistan, where um, basically after this, um, this you know, complicated uh, and rushed withdrawal, uh, Biden, as his last act in Afghanistan, uh, carries out this drone strike that kills a, a, a family of Afghan civilians. The right. uh, father was working with for a U.S. organization, and it, it's curious, you know. And I was thinking about the arguments of your book is how much effort was put in the legal human rights community into drone strikes. Well, it still did not curb something right. as horrific as this final act of the Afghan war. I, I agree with you. I mean, maybe you say it was a special circumstance given the, the, the quite extraordinary level of attention that uh, Afghanistan was getting just for a couple of weeks in, in the American press um, and the need to make the exit, uh, you know, s seem better run than um, it actually was. I mean, it, you know, the, the events of the other week, you know, raise this, this really difficult strategic question because those who are critical of the U.S. government um, are right that dramatizing the carnage is, is the best way to raise bigger questions about the practice and the kind of ongoing wars um, of which they're a part. But you know, I want to highlight this risk that you may kind of succeed in debugging endless war, getting the government to fight more humanely, take more precautions, kill fewer civilians, even as the war gets legitimized. Um, and we can get into this, but I kind of, you know, make some edgy arguments about how that paradoxically was the outcome of Bush era activism and journalism. But you know, in terms of Biden's justification for the pullout, which I, he stuck to, and it was really impressive, um, we we should just attend to the fact that this was the plan all along. You know, Antony Blinken, uh, Secretary of State, said on podcasts before Biden was even elected that the plan was to withdraw and and preserve counter terrorist interdiction, and Biden himself said not to worry that though um, America was giving up counterinsurgency, it was going to double down on so-called over-the-horizon counterterror. So if you, if you have the long view and you think that there are these two wars on terror, the first that Bush started with uh, interventions in Afghanistan and Iraq and heavy footprint war, well, we've been pivoting away from that for years and, and, and Obama most of all. And Biden kind of finished the pivot so that now we're done with the kind of heavy footprint intervention and occupation. And now we've, we've purified, he's promised that he's purified uh, counter terror. Now it's also true that uh, there's, there's allegedly a review underway concerning the drone program in particular and targeted killings in general. Uh, but we just don't know where that goes. All we know is that Biden promised not to give up counterterror, and maybe even there are new reasons for to kind of intensify it with the Taliban in charge of the whole country. You've touched on this, but um, I want to ask you about it more. My personal discomfort with the 
preponderance of attention on the drone program. Mm -hmm. Of course, I think it's a important thing to scrutinize and criticize, but I felt as if the, the conversation around it was drowning out other methods of US warfare. I mean, first of right. all, dirty wars. And again, I go back right. to Syria where you have one of the most expensive covert operations in the CIA's history. And, you know, it's controversial on the left. People have different opinions. But in my view, basically, it was illegally flooding a country with weapons uh, to the benefit of sectarian death squads. And which, you know, I just I was recently in Syria and I saw mm -hmm. just some of the impact of it. And I came away very angry about it. And you look at the discussion on the left in, in the human rights community for the last decade. And, you know, operations like Syria don't get any attention and to the extent they do get attention that they actually get support because you know for people think that it's actually a humanitarian endeavor to uh right. support a one side in the in this in this civil war um i'm curious your thoughts on that and also sanctions too i mean sanctions kill people on mass but yet again it's when, when in terms of the conversation about human rights and, and and waging war humanely dirty wars and sanctions just don't get discussed I agree. Um, you know, it's not what I've written about, but you know, if we if we kind of like just put up a tote board to try to figure out wh what reforms would make most the most difference to global well being in this domain, you know, you pr you might even start with like the arms trade that's kind of supervised out of the Beltway and that affects so many global con conflicts even when America's not involved at all, aside from like having its companies, you know, send weapons to so many different forces. And then of course we get the proxy wars and you've mentioned one and we should add in, you know, Yemen. Um, and these are not humane, none of the above, which we've just been talking about are humane. Um, and Yemen, by the way, also greenlit by Obama. Correct, correct. And, you know, they felt bad about that, Ben Rhodes, et cetera. Um, but, and they they were merciless towards Trump and uh, understandably, but, you know, they haven't owned that we're, we're, we're there because of their choice uh, to and expand still the war and they're, still continue, and they're still Correct. continuing it effectively. Correct. Despite claiming um, to oppose it. Yeah. Correct. So, so all of that is, I agree, way more important. Um, it's it's that you know there is a kind of a, a popular discourse around the, the war on terror when America is fighting it directly, and you know that's what I wrote about just because um, it it seems really important that we got caught up in this dynamic of trying to humanize that war, um, and it 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 is it is a tragedy that it's ongoing. I still would decenter the drone program even within that because we we need to take account of the huge expansion under Obama and Trump alike of special forces deployment. Um, so those are also targeted killing operations under the same you know rules allegedly that demand humanity and you know it, it's 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 equally offensive. So I, I, I don't want to, you know, um, kind of trivialize the, the, the remaining dirty wars to which Americans are party in virtue of having a government that's like the biggest arms dealer through it, it, American companies and engaged in proxy wars. But the war on terror matters, too. And, you know, we're, we're fighting a kind of multi-front struggle against all these different forms. I think, you know, for, for someone who's trying kind of to say something original, um, you know, I'm totally with those who are denouncing dirty wars. It's just, you know, we, we've, we face, you know, kind of limits and how much traction we can get against them. We should keep trying. I want to make sure people are aware that it could be disturbing to get humane war, um, even if it's if, even if the or especially if the loss of life turns out to be less than in the dirty wars. They're still, you know, grievous for a lot of people, and they reflect kind of geopolitical realities we should confront. Do you have any insight into the psychology of officials who take part 
in these policies who, you know, craft the legal memos to justify basically endless war and targeted killings. People like Ben Rhodes, who, you know, uh, sometimes says some sensible things, uh, talks about regret for, for example, greenlighting the Saudi mass murder campaign in Yemen. But then ultimately his former colleagues go back to the Biden administration. And they continue the uh, support for the war, uh, for the war in Yemen and many other uh, military campaigns around the world. Uh, you yourself served as an intern in the Clinton White House when the uh, campaign against uh, the Kosovo bombings happened. Uh, having served uh, in the White House, you know, being a, a professor in the Ivy League, do you have any insight into the psychology of what continues to, in these people's minds, justify the policies that they are carrying out despite the horrific murderous consequences? Well, so, you know, the, the most boring but important factor is just kind of careerism and self-advancement. Um, and that affects, you know, folks in both parties who choose to work in government and, you know, someone's going to work in government. I think we need to get more specific about the, the folks that I think we're talking about now, because, you know, the question is, how do you rationalize um, and that is a psychological question. And I get into it in the book. And I, I, would, I would think of two big factors. One is older, one is newer. The old factor, and, and I was caught up in it, as you mentioned, is the, the persistence of the idea that America is an indispensable um, nation whose military force will make the world a better place if deployed correctly. And that usually means by Democrats for the folks that we're interested in. And they are they really do want to reserve the possibility that there are going to be good wars again. And of course, that they'll present them in real time in that, you know, in that manner. And so they, they I think they they thought in real time, at least some of them, that Libya would make the world better. Uh, what they were doing in Syria, um, even though they couldn't get a humanitarian intervention organized because China and Russia learned their lesson after Libya, that what they still did in Syria would would help. Um, and, you know, m more broadly kind of post-Cold War interventionism, you can't really understand except through the psychology of those who thought of force as progressive. And then I think you get the lawyers under Obama who think, well, at least we've softened the blow by demanding that America fight humanely. Um, and Obama kind of makes a deal, not just with Americans in general, but I think with his own followers and staff who, as you say, um, justify a lot of new wars, um, but can can take solace in the promise that at least they'll be fought morally and that's what my book's about that latter that latter psychological piece because i think it's quite powerful and it helps us understand staffers but you know the fact is obama made that promise to the american people you know he would come out and say we tortured some folks that was wrong. It's not who we are. That was his favorite phrase. Of course, that didn't mean accountability for torturers, but the suggestion was that, you know, humane war is who we are. Um, war is who we are. At least it's humane and it's, it's kind of noble um, in, in its execution. And I think that was a deal a lot of, of his audience, not just his staff, took. To illustrate this point about how things have changed, you draw an interesting contrast in your book between uh, My Lai in Vietnam, the reaction to it, and the reaction to Abu Ghraib in Iraq. Can you talk about that? Sure. So, um, you know, Vietnam is, I think, a turning point for a lot of reasons. Um, first, you know, I, I emphasize how people alive back in the 60s and 70s who remembered World War II and remembered the Nuremberg trials, which, which put Nazis on trial for, for making war, for, ag for aggression. Um, when, they, when they get angry about Vietnam, they say, we need to say this war is 
immoral and illegal. Um, not just the napalming of babies and not just um, the kind of massacre of civilians. And that means that, you know, and also because a lot of Americans are dying, that there's a big enough anti-war movement that when My Lai is revealed um, in 1969, um, the, 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 it's like fuel added to the, the fire of anti-war politics. And among lots of other factors, it leads that war to be brought to a close. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm really, you know, for denouncing atrocity, which you do a lot. Um, and I'm for emphasizing the inhumanity of war and calling for a, the, you know, a, a more moral a conduct of war. But what's interesting in Vietnam is that wasn't all that they did. They also called for an end to war, even um, not just editing atrocity out. Um, whereas after 9-11, uh, in the absence of a strong enough anti-war constituency, um, what happens is almost the reverse. Uh, the Abu Ghraib revelations in spring 2004 and the choice of activists, understandably, to highlight atrocity leads the bug to be um, edited out of the program of endless war. That's what Bush started in the latter part of his presidency and Obama continued it in the way we've discussed. And so that was not people's intent, I think. You know, there was some people who just thought torture is wrong, full stop, we, we criticize it. There are others who hope to delegitimize the Iraq war or the war on terror by focusing on its conduct. But if that was their goal, the consequence uh, was that Obama saw that he could keep the war going by making it humane. And so the result was kind of the opposite of what happened in Vietnam. And I think it should sensitize us to the, the extreme risks that we face when we understandably and rightly kind of make hay out of atrocity, because you could get not what you wish for, which is less war, but something you didn't wish for, more, more humane war. That's what happened in our, our experience. Okay, so this brings me to one controversial aspect of your book, especially on the left, which is that right. you single out Michael Ratner, the, um, the late human rights attorney, um, who was very well known for representing Guantanamo Bay prisoners um, over many years, for back when Haitian migrants were being locked up there to then yep. The war on terror when the bush administration was locking people up from around the world there uh to being julian assange's attorney and being involved in you know just every major human rights issue you can think of so you you actually say that he is an example of this dynamic you're talking about where people who rightly oppose the conduct of the war ended up inadvertently legitimizing it and let me quote you from your piece in the new york review of books which attracted some uh some attention from people who were upset by your portrayal of Michael Ratner. You write, in the years after September 11th, 2001, Michael Ratner set aside the why, whether, and how long of America's global wars and concentrated instead on legally battling for controls on how they proceeded. In the annals of recent history, no one perhaps has done more than this leader of the Center for Constitutional Rights to enable a novel sanitized version of permanent war. By legalizing the manner of the conflict, Ratner paradoxically laundered the inhumanity from what began as a brutal enterprise by helping to recodify a war that thus became endless, legal, and humane. So that's from your piece in the New York Review of Books. I, I just, I take issue with, with a few things there. First of all, is it fair to say that Michael Ratner, that, that no one perhaps has done more than him to sanitize war when, as your book rightly points out, I mean, it's Obama and his team of lawyers who are really doing the work behind the scenes and, you know, from their perch of at the highest seat, seat of power to sanitize war. That's totally fair. You know, I mean, so, you know, Ratner and others, um, 
I think, created conditions and Obama took advantage of them. And in again, as you say, in the Obama chapter, I'm quite clear that he's he's the one who's ultimately, you know, making the decisions. I should say, you know, um, I, I, you know, was was badly understood and it, by enough people that it's my fault uh, around Michael Ratner. You know, what what I wanted to dramatize was that even someone with the sterling anti-war credentials that he could boast, which went way back in his career and to the end of his life under the Obama administration, could be put in a situation where he took action that created these conditions that Obama then like was able to 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 act to um, perpetuate the war. Now, you know, we could quibble about like, well, are, are what do we mean by most important? Because, you know, Ratner deserves credit for when no one thought you could win a case to protect those at Gitmo for trying anyway, even as he dropped some litigation he'd always engaged in around starting American starting war. And so I think he deserves credit as like the single most important legal advocate kind of facing down government after 9-11. And that puts him like at the top of my list of heroes after 9-11. But even with that status, we can't deny that, you know, when you make choices in the world, you, you open up risks. Um, now, it's absolutely true that the, the realizing the, the risks is on a Obama. And that's, you know, that clarification is absolutely essential. Um, what it does mean is that we, we recognize Ratner's life as a tragedy um, because he helped create the conditions in which his anti-war credo ended up being betrayed. Um, and he was part of that because he acted. And when we act, you know, everyone's acting all the time. We, we set up new conditions and we create new realities. And, you know, my take is we, we should really ponder like the paradoxes of what happens when we make choices because we're in a situation now where we can demand that Biden end the war on terror. And this matters because unlike Ratner, most human rights activists in the war on terror never opposed it. In fact, on principle, many human rights organizations in the mainstream, like Human Rights Watch, have said, with the exception of humanitarian intervention, that they never take a stand on the legality of going to war. They only I got that. monitor I got that. his conduct. I got that. So then why make, why make Michael Ratner the face of a position that he doesn't actually hold? Because rhetorically, he was always Good. against the war that he, the wars that he was trying to at least force into being conducted more humanely. That's fair. So, so the article is part of a chapter in the book. Um, and what I try to do is show how both those on the left and the right who, who really, you know, didn't want to see the war on terror become endless um, and kind of ha have credibility in opposing war itself nonetheless play a role in making it endless. Um, you know, the folks in Human Rights Watch, they don't have anti-war credibility. Um, they, all they did was sign up to kind of make war, war crime free. And so it was really, let's say, a narrative choice. Um, but you're right that if, if, if we really want to get kind of critical of some people, it's not Michael Ratner. And again, I didn't, intend to be critical of him. I intended to say, look at this paradox that even when you do commit to an anti-war politics, you may be driven into a situation where you betray some of your ideals because you have no other choice. And of course, in the end, Obama gets the blame, as you say. Right. And in the, in the case of Ratner, I mean, do you fault him for making, should he not have chosen to oppose military commissions at Guantanamo and and win habeas corpus for, for the prisoners there? No, I mean, I think he made the right choices in his moment. The question is about later, because as we've discussed, in 2008-9, essentially the pressure was taken off and a lot of people run victory laps. Um, you know, 
just because Obama is elected and don't demand policy change uh, more than when it comes to kind of egregious conduct of war. And, you know, as I pointed out in my reply in, uh, in a, on a blog called Just Security to some of the critics of my portrayal of, of Ratner, you know, his own associates did things like as early as a few days after Obama was elected, kind of um, call for preventive detention at Guantanamo um, or elsewhere, you know, and say, we have to accept some amount of it. Or they actually worked for the president to authorize drone strikes. And, you know, he never criticized those people publicly, but, you know, he had built this coalition to oppose the war by opposing the way it was fought. But then he saw it melt away. Um, and so this is, a, I think, a tragedy because Obama took advantage of the way that the war had been delegitimated before his presidency in order to re-legitimate it in a new form. That's the point. That's the only point I've tried to make. And, you know, I've, I've even apologized for those who kind of thought that, um, you know, it was a mistake to make Michael Ratner the kind of pivot. On the other hand, he was the most important lawyer who deserves the credit for this focus. And of course, as we've said, it was his only choice in that moment. I think our question has to be, if that's a necessary choice at one point, how do you control the risks later? How do you make sure your coalition stays together so that the warmongering part of it doesn't, you know, join the presidency uh, in order to reinvent the war? Well, no one solved that problem, Michael Ratner, least of all. Well, and it's amazing to look at the to how wars are discussed, you know, going back from Vietnam to today, where, you know, the conduct of the war is allowed to be discussed and the uh, the pragmatism of the war, whether it serves our self, um, uh, our self described interests, whatever that means, but never the the legitimacy of the underlying premise that from Vietnam to today that but that discussion in the mainstream is Agreed. not being allowed. Or it takes decades. Uh you know, and at the waste of, of so many lives and so many billions in, in the Vietnamese case and trillions in ours. And, you know, it's, it's a sad result because even when like enlightenment comes in American discourse, it tends to be about costs for Americans, uh, which are, you know, obviously minor compared to the damage that gets inflicted on the world. Um, you know, part of the reason I think we're both concerned about this is that, you know, precedents are being set for future hegemons because America is not going to be, you know, in the driver's seat of world history forever. Um, and I think um, the United States has set a very poor example. Um, and it, Americans themselves, when, when they're on the other side of things, uh, and less powerful in the world are are going to rue the the choices that American leaders have made and Amer and the American people have allowed through this period. If the U.S. empire manages to give us a, a, a world to inherit, I don't to inherit. Course, I don't, yeah, I don't that's know. that's an that's an open <laughs> question. The book is called "Humane: How the United States Abandoned Peace and Reinvented War." Samuel Moyne, thanks very much. Thanks for having me, Aaron. Thank you.